tonight? Oh, good. Praise God. Let's open our Bibles to uh, Psalm 146. <clears throat> I'm grateful I can sing it all tonight. I woke the, early this morning. I couldn't even talk. <laughs> the Lord is good. Psalm 146, beautiful psalm of praise. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. Amen. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Israel for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, which made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth, forever, which executeth judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry, the Lord looseth the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind, the Lord raiseth them that are bowed down, the Lord loveth the righteous, the Lord preserveth the strangers, he relieveth the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. Praise his wonderful name. Let's go to him now. Our precious heavenly Father, Lord, we're so uh, amazed at your love. We're so thankful for all that you've done for us, Lord. We're thankful even to just be here this evening, this afternoon, in our right mind, and uh, being able to walk just the little things we want to thank you for, Lord. And Father, we know that thou art a righteous judge, and this world is fixed for judgment. But we're so glad that Jesus took our judgment. And we, when we accept that Christ, when we accept that atonement that was made at Calvary, Lord, you take our judgment away. So, Lord, we know that you love the righteous. Those who have accepted the righteousness of Jesus Christ for their own. So, Lord, we're grateful tonight. Lord, if there's anybody here this afternoon who needs the healing hand of the Lord, may you meet that individual this afternoon, Father. Any others that need deliverance or need a, a word of encouragement or need a faith or need a, the joy of the Lord, Father, may you grant it to them this afternoon. And when your speaker comes, Lord, our precious brother Ed, Lord, may you inspire him. 
May you speak through him, Lord, as your vessel to speak to the needs. Because, Lord, we know <clears throat> that it's you that's the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And you can inspire your servant to speak to those needs, whatever need there is this afternoon. So may you bless him and bless your dear people, and especially these precious young people, Father. We thank you for your mercy and kindness. I ask this blessing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. When you greet one another, <clears throat> we have come into his house. you want him to come come in thy strength and thy power oh lord come in thine own gentle
Just now when we sung that verse that says, give me a heart that's filled with love, I'll just share a very short testimony with you, something that I saw where I live in Pennsylvania and it made such an impression on me. Uh, there was this uh, fellow in the next town. I live in a very rural area, a lot of countryside, and there's a lot of, uh, of the plain people that came from Germany the Mennonites and the Amish and so forth. And uh, it's, it's a very, uh, very Christian area where I live. There's over 600 different types of churches and a lot of uh, Christians of varying uh, types. And uh, there was this fellow, his barn burned down. Uh, one afternoon and into the night and I was, uh, up the road at this company, uh, I had to pick up some supplies and the shipping guy was telling me how this fella's barn burned down and I could still see smoke. So when I left there, I drove past where the barn had burned and what I saw absolutely blew my mind. There were probably a hundred different men there of all different types different types of Amish and different Mennonites and different 
Christians like Baptists and so forth, they were all came together. There were horses and buggies there. There were trucks and cars. Uh, some people came on bicycles and on foot. And they all came to help their friend, their brother. They didn't care what church he went to. That didn't matter. Their friend was in need. And they all pitched in. And then the old, the sisters up there, I seen them with their little bonnets. They laid out tables and they had food and, and drink. This is nine o'clock in the morning. And hundreds of people came to help their friend out. I sat in the car and wept. I said, when is the bride of Jesus Christ going to be like that? When, oh God? When will we forget about what church we go to and love our brother the way we're supposed to? Amen. Give me a heart that's filled with love. Amen. That kind of love. Right, friends? Don't you love one another in here? Isn't it a good thing? That's the kind of love that we want to have. The kind that doesn't compare notes, but the kind that sees Jesus Christ in your brother. Even if he doesn't agree with you, you still love him. And you, and you want to help him any way you can. At least that's the way the prophet was. <laughs> right? That's the way Brother Branham was. Now I want to be like that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's sing, uh, you know the song. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. Got the victory? Oh, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, demons will have to flee. Oh, when we come in the name of Jesus, tell me who can stand before. In the precious name of Jesus, we have the victory of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons that have to flee. Who can stand before in name of Jesus, we have the victory. Glory, Father. Glory, Father, for the eternal, eternal victory forever and ever and ever and ever achieved at Calvary. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You may be seated. We only had one day and we have six days. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Just this one day yesterday and this morning was such a fullness. And we have so many more coming. I hope you understand why I put the services together like this and also have in the afternoon service, which is sure it takes a a lot of strength from all of us uh, to be together so long. But I wanted to put as much as possible in it when we have these precious ministers here with us. You agree? It takes, a, it takes a burden to come and listen to believe. Praise the Lord. Uh, before I like to invite Brother Biskel to the platform, I want to just thank the brother that went before and spoke yesterday, Brother Biskel. And how, <laughs> praise the Lord, <laughs> and how he showed us this supernatural element where we are speaking, where we are listening to, how he showed us how this was working in Brother Brenham. And there, and he was a wave chief. There's more to come, like him. That's a promise for you and for me. 
how he showed us and how, how we are happy that we have, have an eyewitness with us, with us that could read this letter, a living epistle among us. Jesus Christ living in a human being, adopted, full with his nature. Still a man, to like patience as we, Elijah, still a man. Many people are, don't understand this. But anyhow, he, God's characteristic, full and folded. And how we appreciate that to hear this and know that the same kind of life is promised to us. I believe this for myself. That this is promised for me. If we can enlarge our, our little face and add these characteristics that he lived before us. How we thank him to give testimony. We, we would like to give him more time this afternoon and also on Friday evening to come again because it's so rich that we can listen to this and enjoy this. You agree? God bless you. And then Brother Tim Pruitt, yesterday afternoon, how this supernatural element is still working, is still working in human beings. How he prophesied under the impact of this supernatural element about the healing of his wife. He just opened his mouth and it just came out, flew out of him. Because he was in that channel. And this channel is not something we have to work up. This channel is very simple. Very simple. Sister Hattie right? she didn't have to work up anything. It was very simple. She just, she just agreed. If you just agree, Jesus, you have healed me. The Holy Spirit will do the work. Always will do the work. And how he uh, prophesied under this impact and how by prayer, this supernatural element, this God, this wheel in the middle of the wheel, how it made a backslidden son run in his pyjama, in his car, drove to the church and gave his life back to God. What, what, prayer, what prayer to this God, what prayer does. That's why I invite especially the ministers in the morning from 8 to 9 o'clock in this prayer room. Let us pray for our young people. God hears prayer. If he makes one man run because it, this prayer was spoken, how he will deliver the, our, our children. I feel it's important. There's no revival without prayer. And Brother John Conte made it clear that if the word doesn't unite with the spirit in our lives, there's no power, no dynamic in our life to live the life of Jesus Christ. And how we need this holy fire to burn our personal demons out. He made it clear it's not enough to know the message. We need the same fire. And only God can give it to us. And it comes sometimes in a way we don't expect. Second day this morning, Brother Isaac Ovid, one taken, one left. We have to know, this was new for me. I mean, I understand astronauts have to be there, have to be trained. But to hear it so clear, we have to have to practice the same condition here on earth before, before we have it up there. We have to be in the same condition. That means you just obey the word. Whatever the word says. If the word says you love your enemy, you just love it because you love Jesus and you love to do what he says. You don't think even about it. You just love him. And God likes it. Because it's the way he, how he shows his children. We are, so we are very thankful for this morning message also to Brother Isaac. Brother Isaac, God bless you. Where are you at? Where is he? Okay, wherever he is, God may bless his ministry. It was direct to my heart also. 
we have to practice. It's not that we have to work up, but you have to do what the voice says, what the word says, because you love him. You can only do it if you love Jesus. Yourself, you cannot, you cannot achieve it. But if you love him, you will just do what he says. If he says this, do this, do this, you don't think yourself. You just committed, you just surrendered. This is, a, this is, this is all. You just surrender to him. And then he comes and do the work. So we have found that pearl of great price, that lost coin. Well, who is this? That's he himself. That's he himself. He said, I am, I will be in you. It's him personally. How do I know who is he? He is experienced by his nature, by his attributes. You can experience him. If you follow his word, these attributes will unfold in your life. And will you take over? It's very easy, but by love. It comes by love. So in this afternoon, I've, I've, I'm finished with my, my comments. It's him. And so when Brother Biskel comes, we are very excited, Brother Biskel, to hear you again. Very excited. And uh, it's a great privilege that God had spoken to his heart, said he should go and come to us here, where we come from different corners. It's, it's, he, obeyed, he obeyed his voice. And we just do the same. I didn't know who, how many will come, how many will hear the call and follow. I thought maybe 200, maybe 1,200, I don't know. I didn't even know the mus musicians. I just wrote, the musicians are invited to bring their instruments. Here they are in what a harmony. It's God doing. God is doing this. I'm so thankful for my Lord. I want to praise him and I want to thank him from all my heart, this fire in my heart. To thank him for that, what he has done. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, I tell you, you, sometimes we beg our Lord. We beg him for this. We beg him for this. And when, when he has done it, we should send with the same fire and with, with, with the same desire in our Thank him from all our heart. Hallelujah. Then we would make an experience and believe him more for the next time. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So... We want to give him enough time so that he can let the living waters flow from his body and from his heart. And uh, when he remembers, give him time to remember back the times when he was together with the prophet that God has sent at the end of this Gentile dispensation to prepare a bride, to prepare you and to prepare me. And uh, uh, it means a lot for us. He did not only preach the message, Brother Branham. But he lived the message. He was a living example. And I appreciate so much to, to, see, to not hear, hear only words, but to, but to see a life. Everybody of us likes to see a life. Everybody likes you to see you living that. That speaks loud. That speaks real. You living it before your children. You living it before your husband. You living it before your wife. That's, 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 that has allowed, that has allowed, we, we, we know this, I don't want to go into it. My heart is open with a longing to partake of this glory that could be seen and felt in this adopted son, example seed son, wave sheaf as a sign that more are coming. God bless you, Brother Biskel. Our hearts are open. Amen. God bless you. I'm going to just take a few moments to make a few comments so you can have your seats once again, if you don't mind. Thank you. I appreciate being able to uh, meet you and be gathered with you uh, in this convention and to meet some new friends and to meet some old friends. This, this morning, uh, we were quite early having 
uh, bite of breakfast, and uh, uh, a brother came in just as we were finishing and getting ready to leave, and he uh, shook my hand, and, and so I shook his hand. He said, you don't remember me? I said, well, no, I don't remember you. <laughs> he said, you baptized me 25 years ago. And... Uh, <laughs> He said, you're up in Mosty in Belarus. Yes, yes. And it was a brother, Senior Pietsevich's grandson, and uh, related to Brother Pietsevich right here and his wife. God bless you, pastor in uh, Riga, uh, Latvia, I believe it is. Uh, I remember when your father, Brother Pietsevich, asked me, he said, Will, will you baptize my grandson? And uh, I said, no, I don't baptize anybody in special meetings. He said, please, it's, it's my grandson. <laughs> so, so that's how that happened. And here we meet all of these years later, uh, and I'm so thankful for that. And we have an opportunity, if it wasn't for this gathering, we wouldn't have an opportunity to meet again like that. And that was, that was wonderful. I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to not only thank our brother Colin Brunner, but I want to thank others that I have uh, seen, been associated with, uh, Brother Francois Lipikar from Switzerland. I'm thankful for him. <laughs> our, our brother Gerd Rodewald from Beaselsburg. Uh, we're thankful for his life. There are some that have come with me, and uh, Brother uh, Colin Brunner has request, had requested that Brother Murphy Wong from our church come. Uh, he is, he is uh, translating in Chinese so that uh, some people, uh, Chinese-speaking people, will be able to benefit from the meetings here as well. Uh, I'm very a very honored and privileged to be also with our brother uh, Timothy Pruitt, who ministered, and and besides our brother Timothy Wong is brother Timothy Dodd. That's t two Timothys, and and then there's one more. Uh, one of my dear brothers who flew up from Johannesburg, uh, brother, brother Timothy Onotoko. I wonder, Brother Timothy, are you here? Could you stand, please, at the back? God bless you, Brother Timothy. I mention these, uh, these individuals because... Uh, each one of them have contributed to my life. Uh, some are younger and some are about my age, but I've learned some things. And our brother Timothy Onotoko, he perhaps doesn't realize, but I've observed their lives. I had opportunity to observe their lives. Uh, brother Murphy Wong, uh, he was doing translating of the Chinese uh, during a live messages while service was going on in uh, our church in Cloverdale. And I would come out after uh, preaching. You'd feel such an unction, such an anointing, and such a, I don't know, such a presence of God. And I would come in to my little study. And that's where we had the computer set up at that time. We didn't have another room for Brother Murphy to be translating to the Chinese. And I would, I would see him on his knees. And I would see his car in the parking lot when I left. And I would see his car when I came back in the morning. This, not, this didn't happen once, but this happened several times. And I said, Brother Murphy... Did you go home last night? Uh, and he just put his head down. No, no, no. I, I, 
was very affected by the message. Sometimes hearing uh, the prophet of God or a local ministry, uh, I like to see people. I learn something from that. I say that is uh, that means a great deal to me. Not because uh, I had participated in the meeting, but because I see a tenderness towards the Spirit of God. And uh, Brother Colin Brunner has asked if I would give some testimony and witness, uh, perhaps more on Friday, Friday evening. I would like to speak today, if I may. Um, but you learn something as you, you pick up things, as you journey, and God allows certain people to meet your life. I want you to listen very, very carefully today, if you wouldn't mind. Because we are, we are all journeying towards our anticipated destination of a rapture. We speak much about the rapture. Uh, we anticipate the rapture. This is why we're here. This is why we, this is why we live. This is why we uh, seek the message, this desire to live the message. I would like to have you note that in the scriptures, Jesus sometimes would speak to the multitudes. There were other times when he purposely would take the twelve. And the Bible says the twelve. And then there are other times, and we cannot question why, but there were other times he would take three, Peter, James, and John. And they were times when perhaps he had something that he was especially wishing to convey. It was Peter, James, and John that went up on Mount Transfiguration. The multitude didn't go up. The 70 were not invited, but the three were invited. And Peter speaks of that again, uh, how they uh, heard and saw in the Holy Mount. And that is where also the prophet of God, all of these generations later, would get uh, the, the text for his message, Hear ye him, because that was what the voice said. Hear ye him. But there was not multitudes there, not that we are opposed to multitudes. We're very happy. But sometimes, and I'm saying these words with a purpose, sometimes God will select someone within the, within the multitude and speak to them in a special way. And I would ask you to prepare your heart uh, and, and uh, just say, God, I've come here to hear from you. Cause, cause a man of God, cause a minister, cause someone to say something that is certain words that I personally need to hear. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear you speak. And I, be I believe that that is very important. Just to be perfectly honest with you, uh, in, in the testimony of things that, times that I was with Brother Branham, I cannot speak of them lightly. I cannot speak of them flippantly. I cannot just speak of them as something I read in a book. This is sometimes the things that you experienced, and they are so sacred, so sacred. Not because I make them sacred, but we speak about the pillar of fire, and I had an occasion to be in the car with the prophet of God on one occasion. And I just want to tell you that it takes a special atmosphere in a service for me to even speak about it, because it was just that holy, that sacred. And uh, I would ask you to be in prayer, if you are in prayer, and that God may allow that. How many here have seen the film Deep Calls to the Deep? May I see your hands? You know, there are things that are, I'm, I'm an observer, and I just observe things, observe people. 
I've, uh, I observed Brother Branham. We didn't, I did not know he was who he was at the first indication at the first time, but it didn't take long, and he took me to Malachi 4 and uh, spoke about the great and terrible day of the Lord. But if you see the film, what you have, the woman is standing on this side, and she, you'll notice the next time, if you have not noticed it, you can notice it the next time. She reaches out and puts her hand on the corner of the pulpit to steady herself. And he is standing here, and he said, that's all right. That won't hurt you. That's him, not me. And friends, I can tell you that presence, that presence is so sacred and so holy. If you were to stand in it, you might wonder if you're even going to live. That's the kind of presence it is. It is just so sacred and so holy. I can't. That is why the prophet said uh, every time he comes, he hears those same words. He knows the voice. Fear not. Fear not. That's why those things, just think that the eternal God is saying to a human, fear not. Because these are very precious times. And if, if we are now in this gathering such as we are, and he comes to you personally, you will thank him throughout eternity for that moment that, uh, that, uh, that uh, atmosphere was created where God and man could meet together. God and a daughter of God can meet together. My brother, my sister, and you young people that are here, let me tell you as one that is your senior and your elder, elder brother, I will tell you it is the most gracious and the most wonderful gift that God can give to a person. I was about 27 when I first uh, took Brother Branham on, uh, on his rest, on a hunt, uh, we took, I'll tell you more about that later, but uh, I had so many deep questions, spiritual questions. I saw the decline of uh, the Pentecostal movement, and believe me, the Pentecostal movement, I really questioned whether I would say anything about this. You talk about praise and you talk about worship, I sat in a service and saw perhaps as many people are, are here in a large building in Edmonton, Alberta. And I was sitting towards the back and, uh, and someone came to the piano and began to just play, lost in the spirit. They didn't know nothing about the piano. And they would play the piano for maybe a half an hour or an hour and the people would rise and and wave and just like the ocean and, and sing and sing in the spirit. And we knew it was, we knew it was supernatural, absolutely supernatural. They weren't even courses or songs that were, were known, but they just sang and it sounded so angelic. I wasn't just a child. I was, I was in my teens at that time. I was a teenager. If you're a teenager, it was here. I didn't come to church to hear somebody preach. We came to church to see what God was going to do because there were always things that were happening, things that were being, things that were taking place, and that's why we came to church. And then this one meeting, I will never forget it. And you might think I'm exaggerating. This is absolutely the truth. On this side, I was sitting on this side, and on this side, it was a narrower building than this, but a long, long building. And about half of that audience stood up on this side, and they cried out in one voice, in one voice, open up ye gates, and let the king of glory come in. And they sat down, and this side rose up and said in one voice, who is this king of glory? And the other side rose up and said, Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Don't tell me it wasn't God. Don't tell me that that wasn't God. That's the only, only way that could happen. 
That wasn't orchestrated. No one, uh, no one anticipated it happening. And on, on my arm, the ha hair just stood up on my arm. And you might be saying, how did that happen? I don't know how it happened. I was there, and that's exactly what happened. But I want to tell you, friends, I don't know any in that, in that audience that took the word when it came. So they didn't have a word to anchor them. And we have a lot to rejoice about because we have received a message. But I only tell you this to help you to appreciate what the message cost. And the message did not come easy. The message came at great cost. And the men whose names I just called, I have seen God in their lives. I've seen men of sacrifice, and you will have opportunity, the Lord willing, to see uh, a Chinese Bible that has been spoken about. Some have heard about it, and some have saw it in, in uh, Switzerland. We brought uh, perhaps 50 or 60 or 70 in Chinese. You might say, well, why would you bring Chinese to this? Somebody knows someone who is Chinese. And I bought one. I, I bought one and, and gave it to one of my Chinese friends, and I have another one that I want to give. And do you know that China, one billion, one billion three hundred million people, and more, more than that, they're increasing. That's an incredible amount, one billion three hundred million people, and yet they did not have an accurate Bible. The reason why I speak about this Bible, uh, it, 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 uh, believers of this message began to discover errors in the King James Version. They said the prophet is saying this, but it's not in our Bible. That isn't what it says. And, and for a number of years, and then it, they kept a diary of it, and it be, began to build up. And we said, well, how can... How can we sit by and see this kind of uh, a problem in the Chinese Bible? And a brother came into my office one day and said, we don't have a King James Version of the Bible. I thought, well, you must have. I went on the Internet, and I saw that there were many. But there, the translations were very, not only very poor, they missed many scriptures. And they had many words that were incorrect. And I mentioned Brother Murphy Wong. From beginning to the finish of the Bible was 18 years. And that brother started, the brother sitting right in the back, started with Genesis 1-1 and went through to the amen of Revelation. It took five years, five long years. And I can tell you, friends, to have a friend that's dedicated, that dedicated, I am impressed with that kind of dedication. And I say, thanks be to God that we of the message are able to provide the Chinese-speaking people with an accurate Bible, one that the prophet of God would not be ashamed of because it is the same as what he preached from. And I say, praise be to God. Thank you for your time. There's also another scripture I'd like to leave with you just before we read scripture. And that is Jesus. We've, we hear a great deal about the Holy Ghost. But Jesus, hear his words. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you, he said one thing, you shall be witnesses unto me. Is that not what he said? Ye shall be witnesses unto me. And he said, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth, period. That's the end of his statement. Some went to Jerusalem. Some perhaps went to Samaria. Some went to Judea. Some went to other places and to the uttermost part of the earth. 
This to me is the gospel that I'm interested in. Taking this message that we have received, you brothers from various places and ministers especially should be gripped with a passion, a passion of the prophet. Here he flew. We didn't have jets in his time, and he flew with prop, uh, propeller-driven planes, uh, and, and into Mozambique, and into South Africa, and up into uh, Zimbabwe, I guess, and different places. I don't know all the places. Way into the far north of Canada, and we just learned from our brother George Smith, who was here. My wife was always wanting to know his first visit there, and it was 1949, in September 1949. It wasn't simple. It wasn't easy driving. It was a very primitive at that time. And uh, this was the kind, and when that prophet speaks about rugged believers, that's what we want to be. Praise be to God. We're here to preach a rugged gospel. Hallelujah. And we believe it with all of our hearts. Amen. If you wish to stand with me, I'll read some scripture. I'd like to read out of... Just give me a moment here. I want to read out of Exodus, the third chapter. We'll begin reading at the second verse. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of the, thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Let's bow our heads, please. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm always so conscious and so thankful that I can call you our Father, and you are my Father. And we know, as the brother said earlier today, that we have come from God, and we go back to God. Oh, Father God, I thank you for the message that you have sent. I thank you for the revealing of Jesus Christ thy beloved Son who you gave and sent as a sacrifice of sin. And you have accomplished that redemptive work. And you have shown, O oh God, your purpose of election, your purpose of, in predestination. We thank you, O oh God, for the gathering of the people that is here today. And we pray that your blessing by the Holy Spirit's attendance will be near us, O oh God, Near each one, I'm praying for my brothers and sisters individually. I pray, Father, that they may experience what their expectation is. And I ask, Father, that you will give and raise an expectation in their hearts and souls, one that you shall be pleased with. I pray, Father, that they may draw aside during these meetings. Draw aside as Moses, and it said, you have said that, when you saw that he drew aside, you spoke to him. I pray that you will speak, O oh God, what needs to be heard by the individual people, brothers and sisters, and young people alike, 
and even children, as we heard from our brother Tim Pruitt, at five years old, giving his life to Christ and never taking it back. Oh, God, we thank you that you can speak in such a way, even to a young person, a young child, or so you can speak to an elder person and to the parents, Father. There may be parents that are struggling with their young people. I pray in the name of Jesus you will endue them with a, not only power, but endue them with the discernment and wisdom of the Holy Ghost. Bless now thy word, I pray, in Jesus Christ's name. And the words that shall be spoken, I pray you'll bring to my remembrance the things that you would have me to utter. And may it be confirmed by the Holy Spirit to the hearts of the people. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. And may everyone say amen. 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 You may be seated. I want to take uh, some moments to speak to you, please, on uh, there is a place by me. Moses, and then we will go from Moses uh, into, the, into the message. But there is a place by me. Every one of us, you have gathered. This is not where you live. On this hillside, in this campground. So you came from some place. You came from your village, your town, your country. You perhaps flew or took an aircraft as we did and others have done so and we moved from one place to another place. There was a purpose and a reason for that. And now uh, Moses, has, Moses knew what it was to be in the palaces of, of Egypt and to walk on those rich carpet grounds. He knew what it was as a military hero to ride in a chariot and to, to come into the, uh, the voices of the thousands of people. And he knew what it was to receive honor and glory of man. And now, because of a, a, a very unfortunate thing in his life, he murdered a man. And you perhaps now, you want to be serious. You may not care for him as, a, as your leader, but he's the one that God had called. And God doesn't change his mind. Do you understand? Can you say amen to that? Amen. And that's, that's, that's our God. That's his nature. And, and Moses had slain a man and hid him and ended up being a vagabond prophet out in the wilderness and caring for some flocks or whatever, some cattle. And while he's there, uh, a bush is on fire. He's attracted to this bush, and he goes and, he's, and uh, hears a voice out of the bush. And the prophet of God said, what Moses was lacking, the, the, the pillar of fire had. The pillar of fire had what he was lacking. And I can tell you today, whatever we lack or whatever we have need of, I can tell you that, there, that, that the pillar of fire it has the, has the presence of God that you crave for. Has uh, whatever it is you desire or need, the pillar of fire has what the body of Christ needs. And so he's moved from one place to another, but the voice say, speaks to him and says, remove your shoes or put off your shoes from off your feet for the place whereon thou standest. Friends, that place was not holy. Moses didn't take anyone else back there. There wasn't anything sacred about that spot, but it was sacred at that moment, at that time, because God was going to meet with a man at that point. And now this is a, this is a different kind of a place. Now, you have come here to this auditorium and this place can become a special place. Uh, this place can become a special place. Uh, I don't think there's anything special about the construction of this building.
But a place becomes very, very special when God meets man. Now I can tell you that I, as a young man, I had been a minister for, 20, for seven years, been preaching for seven years, and I saw things within, uh, within the church world at the time. I don't mean denominational world. We did not believe in denominations. We had a background of, uh, of the Scandinavian belief, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is one that each church is sovereign. And that's what we believed back then. Each church was sovereign. And we did not believe in a hierarchy. We did not believe in general overseers or bishops. We believed that the church, were, and so it was, a, it was, to me, it was the highest quality of, of Christianity available. And I was a minister uh, uh, under in, within that group of fellowship of churches. We had one little church in the far north of British Columbia in Dawson Creek, where my wife, who was here, was born in that city, in that town. And uh, that's where the Alaskan Highway begins. I'm sorry, I meant to bring, I had a large map, and I was going to put it up so you could see. It was a very large map and about five foot tall, and you could see the area. Because it's important to see that uh, even when the prophet of God um, drove all the way up there, he drove there all the way from Jeffersonville. And it was, it was a long, long journey. And yet he would come up to that place. And uh, I didn't know who he was, except I had been in his meetings and uh, I, th I, I had seen a, a girl, which I will tell you about on another occasion. I saw a, a blind girl healed. And I was in about the third row on this side, sitting on the aisle. And, uh, and the platform was higher than this one. And uh, Brother Branham prayed a prayer I have never heard before. But he prayed, he prayed for her, and, uh, nothing, and he looked at her, and nothing changed. He prayed the second time, and the third time, and the fourth time, and the fifth time, and the sixth time, and I was counting. I was 14 years old. I was counting, and I thought, like all the other ministers, when it's something that's inside, wonderful healings take place. But when it's something that I can see with my own eyes, nothing's happening. And this girl's eyes were just white. Just white balls was all that could be seen. And then uh, he just put his arms around her head. She was about 10, 12 years old, ringlets down to her shoulders. And he put his arms around her head like this. And he just held her like that. And he said, Satan, an angel from God, ministered this gift to me and told me that if I could get the people to believe, nothing would stand before my prayers, not even cancer. I adjure you in the name of the living God. Loose her and let her go. And that time he did not look at her. He just turned, took her by the shoulders and turned her this way. And I was looking straight at her. Her eyes were as straight as mine. And I tell you, then the people went into wild ecstasy and began to praise and thank God. And the little girl is looking up at the lights because the lights were bright. And Brother Branham lifted her up. And she's looking at the lights. And I could even see the tears form in her eyes. Uh, as, uh, as she looked at the lights, she was not accustomed to it. And, uh, and, of course, the people were filled with ecstasy. But the thing that happened, something lodged in my heart. And I thought, no, I've, I've never heard, I've never seen a man that spoke to angels before. Here's a man that is, I've heard now has spoken to angels. Here's a man that God hears. Here's a man that the supernatural happens. And it, and it was just quietly, he just prayed a simple prayer and it was done. I tell you what, friends, the power of God was very, very present. And, and that lodged in my heart for years. So that was still in my heart when, uh, when I... A, far, a, a rancher friend of mine called Bud Southwick, whose name's now 
uh, you have seen many times in the message, but Brother Branham didn't know Brother Bud Southwick. He was a close friend of mine because he was just a rancher, and I would go up to his place and back and forth, and he would come and sell some cattle and stay in our home. And this one night he was in our home, and uh, another, another minister was there who had preached in my church, and he, he, uh, he said, this brother Southwick was saying, Brother Bud, I always call him Brother Bud. He said, uh, he said uh, the, the game department, the uh, department that is in charge of harvesting the animals, he said they were wanting to give me a large territory up on the Alaskan Highway. And I just, I didn't even take it serious. I thought, well... Bud is just becoming established as a rancher. He's got a, maybe 200 head of cattle and horses, and he's got five little sons and a wife, and certainly he's not going to go up there because he's just starting to get himself established. And the next thing I knew, he had he'd got, sold his farm, I guess it was, or sold his ranch and went way up on the Alaskan Highway. And I was, I was literally speechless that he would do that. And I thought, I hope that's not a big mistake. But we let this, this man, this minister, who, whose name is also in Brother Branham's messages, A.W. Rasmussen, was in my home that night. And that was the only time he was in my home. And he said, you know, Brother Biscoll, he said, you should write. You should invite Brother Branham. He said, you know, he loves to hunt, you know. And uh, I, 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 I thought, well... Brother Branham probably receives 100,000 letters a month. He would never find my letter anyway. But I recall sitting down at a big old oak desk, and I wrote a, with a pencil and paper, I wrote an invitation to Brother Branham to come. And we didn't hear anything. I didn't get an answer for a year and a half. And I didn't expect an answer. I just thought, this will get lost in all of his mail. But instead... And during that year and a half, I resigned the church where I was, and we moved about, and I went to the Native Indian people of Canada and uh, settled my family in a, in a small city called Victoria, which is our capital, British Columbia. And uh, uh, it was, it, uh, we were only three weeks there, and I got a letter from Billy Paul saying that his father would like to go on a hunt and suggested a certain time in May. And uh, uh, so I, I was so surprised and delighted. And then Brother Branham and I made some communication. I can't remember all the communications, but I've kept every letter from him and every letter from Billy Paul. Still have it in a file in my home. And just recently I showed it to some of our young men because uh, I, I kept them because some of the things that the prophet of God just said were very, very personal, very, very precious. He wrote me one letter just one week after his mother passed away. And I've always held that very, very dear. I thought that he would take time to write me a letter, a personal letter, one month, one week after his mother had passed away. And you can read in the message how he appreciated the people that gathered around him and the people that went to the hospital and stood with his mother and, and the Brother Sothman and different ones, and he so appreciated and, and the flowers, and he talked about it in one of the messages, which I didn't pull up just now, but he was so appreciative, and he, he thanked them so much. And then to find that he had time to write me a letter, I was humbled by that, I was very humbled by that. And then one letter, he, he, he just said, Brother Eddie, you'll never know what your friendship has meant to me. And I was very humbled. I didn't even want to show that letter. And I, I hesitated even mentioning it. Now I don't want it to be misunderstood. But that was uh, just one of the things that I felt if, if we were able to give him a rest. And friends, I was like the Shunammite woman. I wish you'd had the opportunity. I didn't expect anything in return but to get his friendship in return means more than even this gathering here to me. Just to have that kind of association 
that kind of friendship and to be able to observe. Friends, I hope you understand this. I, I got a window into eternity. I watched, I watched that man. I watched him when a wild horse is trying to actually kill Brother Southwick. And I said to Brother Branham, he was standing right beside me, I said, Brother Branham, I said, that, that horse is going to injure, going to hurt uh, Brother Southwick. And he said, yeah, he's, uh, he, he's mean, isn't he? I said, yes, he is. And he, this was the second day. And Brother Southwick, who knew horses, he was a horseman, and he knew and he thought he would break his, break his will on this horse, would break the will, and, and he was trying to put a pack saddle on him. And it wasn't possible. Are you interested in this? Do you want to hear this? I turned around, and I just saw him slipping his hat on his head. He just had a few words with Father, our Father. I hope it's your father. And that horse, his nature was changed from that moment. I'm a man of the wilderness. I'm telling you the truth. That animal's nature was changed. Changed became like a kitten. We packed that horse every day. That horse treated, was treated like every other animal. And it was just, his nature was, what kind of a God have we got? We got a God who gives a horse a horse nature, who gives a dog a dog nature, gives an animal an animal nature, gives a human a human nature, and he knows how to change our nature. He knows how to make us Christ-like. And friends, when I hear about us becoming like Christ, I realize because I've seen it, I've seen this message, I've seen this messenger do that, and, and, uh, and an animal changed in, a, in an instant of time. Who can do that? Nobody but the God who created him. And I tell you the truth. That animal changed completely that very day and became just mild, a wonderful, wonderful horse for the rest of that journey, which was about 10 days. Do you believe it? I'm talking about a living God. I'm talking about a God I have seen change. This isn't just words. This is something that takes place. I've seen them change humans. I've seen them change drunkards. I've seen them change my father. Hallelujah. And I'm ready to give glory to God because we don't serve a dead God. We serve a living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this message is a living message. Do you believe what I'm saying? I've been asked to give a witness and I want to be a true witness of a true vine. For Jesus Christ is the vine. And any time it will sprout another, another branch, it will be a Pentecost. Listen, friends, this is nothing different than happened in Pentecost. Men and women were changed. People who couldn't write their names were changed. Hallelujah. And nothing is, nothing is different today. It's the same God. Hallelujah. And we've come to a sacred place. Do you believe it? Hallelujah. Glory. Amen. I'm just thinking because some things I can say and some things perhaps I cannot say. I don't want to be misunderstood. But I tell you, friends, these are precious moments. And you have come here because you claim to follow a message that God used this vessel. And this was a prepared vessel. And I spoke on the first service on uh, uh, a body hast thou prepared me. My brother, my sister, I had much more to say because we are the body of Jesus Christ and we will not reach a rapture without the full preparation. We don't have to prepare ourselves so much even though the bride has prepared herself. But, but God has designed things for us. 
In fact is, I want you to hear me now very clear, and especially you that are young people, and I see young men and young women in this message. In this message, it's more than just a phrase. We're not in the message so much as we need to have the message in us. Hallelujah, the word of God abiding in us. Amen. In Jesus' prayer in John 17, he speaks of his disciples and those that have believed on him. And he said, thine they were, and thou gavest me them. Think of that. That was something they didn't even know. That is something that we might know mentally, but we know in our, in our very being, that we belong to Christ. And God has given us to this message before the foundation of the world. He gave us to this message. You might have said, you accepted it. He accepted you. He called you. He sent a word that would fit you and to bring you from where you were. He wanted you in another place. Jesus walked where they were fishing. And there were, there were men who had been born into families. There was John and Andrew and Peter and James. And these men that were fishermen. And they were with the, two of them were with their father. And that's the place they were. Whether it was a dock at the lake, I don't know. I've been to, the, I've been to that place uh, near that place in, uh, in uh, Israel, and that's where they were. But somehow now here came the master. Here came the creator. Here came the masterpiece. Hallelujah. And he needs them in another place. Not where they're fishermen, but he needs them in another place. He knows what he's going to do. He knows the words that he's going to speak. And he's got to have some faithful men who will be true witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ at that time. And listen to me, my friends. I'm, I'm thankful that I have the energy and the time and the health that God has given to allow me to be one more time here. And what I give you today or what I speak in these services is a true witness of the true vine for Jesus Christ is the vine and he's the one. He's the one who changes the nature of a horse. He's the one who saw what was in my heart. And I thought, oh God, how can we be in such a church? How can we have such a message as we have? Not the message of the hour, but we had a message as well. And we were spreading the gospel and we were preaching. We had services. I know what it is to come behind the pulpit and the Holy Spirit come down and to, I've collapsed over the pulpit and wept till the end of the service. I know what it is to experience those things. We've seen those things and we've seen lives change. And, but that wasn't when the word came. Neither of my deacons took it. My two deacons didn't take it. I couldn't hardly believe it. They were like brothers in the flesh. And that's where we learned what separation was. Sometimes very dear people, family. I had one sister. And then a, a, a half-sister. My father remarried after my mother died. As I said the other night, I was six and a half years old. Stood at her coffin. I'm not telling you this to have a teary service. I'm telling you this because it's the truth. Those were not easy days. And that was not a, a self-imposed sacrifice. I'm going to stay with this till you understand it. Jesus had a great life of sacrifice. And he called men. And also women attended to his needs. But he called men that were prepared to sacrifice. And when I read the scripture, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. After that the Holy Ghost has come. He says one thing. You shall be witnesses in Jerusalem. 
in Samaria, in Judea, and into the uttermost part of the earth. It's not just living a life. Some of you young people may be going to further education. I'm going to unload my burden now. Is that all right, Brother Kuhlenbrunner? I'm going to unload my burden. It, it is not the Holy Spirit will come upon you to make you a, a better professional person or to give you a better job or to give you a higher, a higher education or to give you better skills. That's not the point. The Holy Ghost comes upon us to make us witnesses, live living witnesses, whatever form that takes in your life. But it will call for some sacrifice. And I can tell you it calls for sacrifice. Listen to me back there. It calls for sacrifice. And some are self-imposed. People have said, no, I will, I'll turn aside from that. And I'm going to give my life this way. Now comes an opportunity. Do you know what, friends? You're looking for a rapture. And as long as there's one yet to, they will be left to get one left. As long as there's one soul left. How do we know? Who's going to reach them? I don't know who's going to reach them. What country are they in? I don't know. Our brother Tim Dodd will say something and we maybe show some pictures of you. Just reached this message. Just reached into Ethiopia. And I am so thankful. I can say to you brethren that are uh, of African descent. How thankful we are. I, I look upon it as a great honor. That God has given us a great honor. To take the message into a country of 90 million. That have never been exposed to the message. And here we are. End time believers. In the end time. Talking about the rapture. And, uh, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Become baptized. And then our brother Bus goes back to Uganda. Because they only allow him to stay in the country 30 days. And he's going back to the country of his origin into Uganda. And he's leaving and the people gather around him. One was a prostitute. And others had various religions. You know what they said to this brother? Are you leaving us now? Are you going to leave us? Listen, I'm not talking about history. I'm not talking about history. I'm talking about today. Today while we sit here. This group is meeting up in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa. They're meeting there, and they're meeting in another city about 50 miles away. We've never encountered some of these things. Never encountered it. They speak another language. 50 miles, 50 miles, about 60, 70 kilometers away. They don't even speak the language of the nation. They speak their own language. I ask you, I'm 81 years old. I'm saying to you, do we have a responsibility? I say, yes. Yes, we have a responsibility. I don't know how. I don't know when. But somehow we'll get this message into their hands so they can read the things that I read. They can feel the same spirit that I feel. Hallelujah. Can you not say amen to that? Glory to God. This is the gospel, I believe. This is the kind of Holy Spirit. I'm, after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me, perhaps in your country, maybe in a neighboring country, but it might be Ethiopia. It might be some other place. I do not know, but all I can tell you, and I don't need to tell you, I'm filled with a passion. Furthermore, I'm not ashamed to say I'm filled with the Holy Ghost because the Spirit of God within me says, you must go, you must take it, you must show them the life of this Word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. What do I hear from this side? Praise God. What do I hear from this side? Praise God. 
What do I hear from this middle section? Praise God. What do I hear from this side? Praise God. Then we are of one mind. We are in unity. This must take place. This is a holy spot. We've come to a sacred place. Amen. Glory to God. Praise God. And I see young men robust, strong. I, oh God. Thank you, brother. Oh God, continue to give me my youth. I have eternal life, but I put it into this body and let it continue to be a testimony of Jesus Christ. People talk about my age. I, I don't only feel about maybe 50 years old. And, and, and what sacrifice? What sacrifice? There is no sacrifice. Everything's an honor. Everything's a privilege. You people, whether you're from Germany, whether you're from Africa, whether you're from another place, I desire that you'll be there a different person, burning inside. Like Jeremiah tried to keep it silent because it was going to make enemies for him. It was going to make division for him. It was going to cause people to leave him. And he tried to close up his mouth, but he said it burned in his bones. That's the God we serve. Hallelujah. That's the God of reality. The God of Elijah. The God of Elisha. The God of Jeremiah. The God of the prophets. That's our God. He's the God of Abraham. The God of Isaac. And the God of Jacob. And the first thing he says to Abraham, he says, leave thy kindred. Leave thy country. Leave thy... I'm not asking you to leave it. I'm just saying we must be willing. To do whatever it takes. We have, one, we have one call in this age. We have one call as believers of the message. And that is to get the message to every hungry person. Education must not get in the way. Our profession must not get in the way. Use it as a tool to further the gospel. But whatever you do... That's the life I believe. I believe it with all my soul. My wife and my daughter are sitting there, sitting right behind our brother and uh, my eldest daughter. And they, they know what it is to be without daddy because father has been away. We've been in South Africa. We had radio on Swazi Music Radio. And the people there said, here's a little tape of Brother Branham, a little eight millimeter cassette. And they showed me, and Brother Branham, he's arriving at Johannesburg, and they've got his passport stamped that he cannot preach in the nation. And I hear him on this little eight millimeter. He's saying, oh, how I'd love to start preaching just now. But I believe that Africa will hear my voice again. And the brother asked me, can you get the Bible Believers broadcast in Africa? And in three weeks, we were on 100,000 watt Swazi music radio right between Orr Roberts and Jimmy Swaggart. I say that's God that arranged that. That was the half hour slot they gave us. And we went on that and we're on that for several years. But we had people contact me. I had people uh, that I spoke to and they said, Brother Biscoll, maybe they call me Brother Eddie, I don't know. But they said, when we heard the prophet's voice coming over the radio, they said, we fell to our knees. We put our head to the floor. Oh, God, you, you spoke to him. He said, I believe that Africa will hear my voice again. And here it was happening. I say, friends, we have a living God. And I want to say to you, God loves this message. God loves this word. It's his word. He loves this word. He'll stand behind this word. He'll stand with you when you stand with him. And you stand with his message. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give him all the glory. We'll give all the glory to the Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, brothers, for your support. Thank you for your prayers. Hallelujah. We believe it. We are believers. This is what he said. And this is what he said. Brother Branham said, here's the secret. Here's the secret. And the, the word is in the bride. And he said, furthermore, and she knows what he wants done with it. She has the spirit of God. She has the word of God. And she, the bride, knows what the bridegroom wants with the word. We know what we're doing. We're not ignorant. We know what we're doing. We know when I speak to you, this is exactly what he once said. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is a time to rejoice. We believe it. We're prepared to demonstrate it. We're prepared to go if he says go. We're prepared to stay if he says stay. We're prepared to preach if he says preach. And we're prepared to be silent. We know what sacrifice is. You might just, uh, you might just think, well, we mentioned certain people. I mentioned Brother Tim Dodd. How many know our Brother Tim Dodd? Quite a few hands. For those of you that don't, here's a man that pastored a church for 28 years. Started it from nothing. Started in our city where my wife was born. And her sister became the piano player, simple piano player. Just having little meetings. You know how many was in the church? Four. Including Brother Dodd and his wife. My wife's sister and her mother. I baptized her mother at 82 years old. She died at 98. I tell you, friends, don't tell me that God isn't a living God. God can reach them even if they're old. God can reach them when they're 82. I baptized her at 82 years old. Say amen. That's your gospel. That's your message. Amen. That's the kind of power we believe in. Brother Dodd became the pastor. And then he felt to move the congregation, which now was maybe six or eight persons, and to move them down to Grand Prairie, Alberta. There's about 60, 70 miles, maybe 100 kilometers down the road. Brother Tim, you'll forgive me, but I, I feel I need to say this. And I was desiring. I needed somebody because of my age, because of the future. Somebody has to take this great work. And our own congregation, which is several hundred people, but they don't realize there's more people outside than there is inside. There's a bigger congregation outside, and they need, uh, they need the message, and they need help, and they need whether it's song books or whatever, whatever. We just want to be a, 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 an aid to help them. We started in the house. We started with a few people. And then when there were too many in the house, we built a log church. But in the log church, there was a young man. Hello, young man. He was just out of high school. Big, tall fellow. About six foot five. And he was a genius up here. He could work around with a... With a he would be a, a, a computer... Geek, you know. He was a techie guy. And, but I, I see everything through the eyes of the message. And we need that kind of people. We need people who are really smart. People who can do things I could never do. And I said, these tapes, they're very poor. And they need, and I know Brother Branham was burdened about them. 
and they need to be cleaned. And we need to start to filter them. He said, I, I, he stuttered a little bit. He said, I, I, I can do it, will you? We'll get this kind of a machine, that kind of a machine. We'll get this scope, and we'll, I'll listen to every tape for four years. He listened to tapes. And as he listened, he made a diary of a certain sound that came in at so many feet of the tape. And a, and a kind of howling sound or a whistle or something and then it would end and he would get the, 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 the tone of it and get the exact uh, amount of it and then he would get the filters and filter that sound out if it was possible. It was air conditioning, we couldn't do it because it went across the whole tape. But for four years, he did 530 types. 530. Do you know why? You brothers from Africa. Do you know why? Do you know what motivated me? I sat with brothers. I sat with brothers. And they sat across from me. And their dark eyes looking at me. He said, we can't understand. The tapes are so noisy. I just decided in my heart, something has to be done. We couldn't find a way. We didn't have the money. We didn't have the people. But if, it'll, if you have action, if you're ready and burdened, God will make a way. And God made a way. And many of the tapes you hear today were cleaned up in a little room by one boy out of high school. Hallelujah. Does God know how to do things? He knows exactly how to do things. And we began, we began to make libraries. And we made libraries. I thought if I could get some other churches, we made libraries. And we sent them out. And different people, uh, Brother Henry Green, who's passed away now, in North Carolina, Brother Henry Green made about 16 copies and sent them down into, uh, down into I can't say Trinidad, but down into that, that part of, uh, of the Central America. And he sent 16 copies of the, of the libraries down there. And then one day we got a phone call from Brother Joseph Branham. And he wanted to purchase the equipment, the duplicating equipment. We had very fine equipment. I always believed this message calls for the best. And if the best is in Germany, we'll get it from Germany. If it's in the United States, we'll get it in the United States. This message de deserves the best. And when you see that Chinese Bible, it's on India paper and it's gold leaf on the outside and it's beautiful leather because it, God's word desires the best. We don't waste it, but I believe it deserves the best. And Brother Joseph picked up the uh, duplicating equipment and carried on. We had done 530, and I believe he's done all uh, uh, 1,100 of them. I don't know his, his program exactly, but I'm so glad that they put on the, the VGR, the VOG, whatever you want to call it, and distribute books all over the world, tapes all over the world, and puts it on the Internet. Hallelujah. And furthermore, I said this voice... This voice of this prophet needs to go on the internet. And before people were thinking about putting voice on the internet, we went to a large uh, university in Vancouver. It has 30,000 students. And they have gone into business. And their business is, uh, is uh, being, they have large workstations or large uh, uh, repositories where they keep libraries for for telephone companies and so on. Excuse me. I'll get up here where you can see me. And then uh, uh, we, we'll put these out there. And we went and had a meeting with them. Will you put this library on, on, on the Internet for us? Yes, they will do so. They gave us a price. We said, do it. And, and shortly, Brother Branham's voice was on the Internet. And many others since then have had it on the Internet. I don't care what other people do. I say, do all you can. Put it in any language you can. 
Hallelujah. If somebody steps up here and says, I can, I can I translate into the Ethiopian language, we'll be right behind you. We'll say, God bless you. We don't believe in any competition. We believe in getting this word out. Can you say amen? We don't believe in competition. We say, God bless you. You do all you can. Do it as fast as you can. And do it as good as you can. Hallelujah. I don't have to ask you if you see what my first love is. That's my first love. Because the message and the person of Jesus Christ to me are synonymous. Do you understand what synonymous is? The same. The same. The message. The life. You speak of the life of the message. The life of the message is Jesus Christ revealed in you and to you. That's the life of the message. That's what I believe. And that's why I believe the next person needs. They need to hear it whether they accept it or whether they reject it. They still need to hear it. Thank you. Me, I'll try to tell you this now. I pastored in a church. I was in that place. I had a lovely wife and three daughters. And I'd be in the home and I'd be in that place with them. And I was caring for, I was working at a job. Things are coming to me that perhaps I shouldn't say. But I came to work one morning in a furniture store. A furniture store I used to own when it was just a junk place. And I sold it to these two men, two businessmen, Lutherans. And we would talk about Luther. We would talk about the, uh, what he stood for. And now... The two of them and myself, three, are standing there first thing in the morning. And they said, we had a visit last night from the local Catholic priest. And uh, my father spent his inheritance, which was very small. But he, he pre reprinted tracts of converted nuns and converted priests. And he put uh, all the pamphlets in a, in a package. And they delivered the packages. He and the two or three other people delivered the package to every household in that city. Now about 10, 12,000 people. Then they delivered it to the countryside, to the farms that put it in the mailboxes. And they took it to a town north, which I will mention. Brother Branham spoke under the pillar of fire, and he mentioned Fort St. John, as a man was dying there with cancer. And, in, and they delivered it to every home in Fort St. John. Are you listening, friends? And they said, until as long as Ed Biscoll is in your store, we have 2,000 2,000 Catholics in this city and they will not buy anything from your store. They will not patronize your store as long as Ed Biscoll is there. And the one man spoke up, very fine man and very good friend of mine. He said, well, Ed Biscoll didn't send those out. It was his father, Fred Biscoll. He said, it doesn't make any difference to us. It doesn't make any difference as long as he is there there will be no Catholic that will purchase from your store. Listen to me, friends. I'm not talking about the dark ages. I'm talking about my life. 
I'm talking about my food for my table. I'm talking about my children, which my daughter is here. That's what I'm talking about. We're, we're talking about a current gospel, but there is a power inside. I said, I may not agree with how my father did it, but I will not, I do not disagree with what is written on those tracks. And so be it. You will not have to fire me. I will willingly leave. And I left. Did I have a job? No, I didn't have a job. Did I have a paycheck? No, I didn't have a paycheck. Did I have anything? Did I have any reserve? No, I didn't have any reserve. It's God's business. And I knew God didn't want me to cower under that, under that power. I said, no. Was a sacrifice? That's what I call self-imposed sacrifice. Did I consider it a big sacrifice? No, I really didn't. Sitting over here is Brother Tim Dodd. He had another kind of sacrifice. And that was God allowed, God imposed. He's a young man. His wife is a beautiful young woman. They have eight children. And he gets up on Sunday morning and he's just showering to preach. And he thought, I'll just leave my wife to rest for a little bit. And she'd had a couple dizzy spells. And God had heard when he prayed. And this time, when he comes out of the shower, his wife is sitting on the edge of the bed and keels over backward and is gone. That fast is gone. And he began to pray. And God spoke to him. Excuse me, brother. Tim. God said, not this time. To have God tell you not this time. Last time he prayed, God answered the prayer. He did what he asked him to do. This time his wife is laying up. Breath is gone. And God's saying, not this time. That man is sitting right over here. You'll see him on Friday. He's the one who went to Uganda. He's the one who said to Brother Buzz, why don't you take your honeymoon? He took their wedding. Why don't you take your honeymoon in Ethiopia? And they went up to Ethiopia. That's how the gospel got to Ethiopia. But if he stayed pastoring his church, if he stayed there, and he could have stayed, but he realized, I can't stay without my wife. I need to have my wife as a wife of a pastor. He had to go to church and tell them Sister Allison's gone. They were just with her. Young ladies, that's a God-imposed sacrifice. But if it wasn't for that sacrifice, he wouldn't have gone to Uganda. If it wasn't for that sacrifice, he wouldn't be working night and day all over the world, answering emails, people that send them emails. Can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And we're there. Anything that we can do, we seek to do it. I just took my phone off just before I came to the meeting. A brother from Malawi has written a pastor, and he has a, a major thing. He wants me to phone him. And I'm speaking to another pastor from Boston, United States, in Massachusetts. And he's setting up a meeting, wants a meeting, and two weeks after we arrive home from here, I tell you, my brother, my sister, I don't know. Maybe, he's in, maybe it's one in Ethiopia. I think they need to hear it. Don't you agree with me? They have a right to hear it, don't they? They have a right to hear it. Let me see some of you still people. They have a right to hear it. Do they not? And so it's up to God. 
And some lived, and the prophet spoke about in the church ages. He spoke about some that give up their lives by dying because they would not bend. They would not bow, and they would not burn. That's the kind of people the bride of Jesus Christ is. That's what I call rugged Christianity. And the message makes rugged Christians. Not some flimsy little here today, gone tomorrow, up today, down tomorrow. No, no, that's not the faith of Abraham. The faith of Abraham is plodding on. Every step you take, I give you the land. Hallelujah. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? I'm talking about a real gospel. I'm not talking about something fictitious. I'm not talking about a counterfeit. I'm talking about a genuine gospel. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't say that you're a counterfeit. Not at all. I believe it's real genuine. I'm just encouraging you on with my burden. Is that all right? With my burden. I didn't come here just to preach you happy. I came here to lay my burden upon you. Where are you, God? Young men, young women, where are you? Raise your hand. Say, here I am. Here I am. God send me. God use me. Brother Daniel called a brother and Brother David Mayer, perhaps you're here, and others of, uh, from, uh, from Russia or Riga were in Switzerland. And a boy, Brother Pietsevich, and I talked about the Chinese Bible. A boy about that tall. I don't know who he is. Was waiting for me outside. And he waited till all the people went by and we shook hands and he's waiting. Waiting, I don't know what he's waiting on. And he takes my hand. He said, uh, I want a Chinese Bible. I have a, Chi I have a Chinese friend. I said, God bless you. I just wanted to hug him. I thought, that's such a wonderful spirit. That's the kind of spirit. Hallelujah. Maybe I'm just excited. I'm thrilled about this. So I was in a church. I was comfortable. As you were, Brother Tim, I was comfortable with the congregation I had. I loved, I, had, I was loved and dearly loved of deacons and our people. And we were at each other's home all the time. But there was something inside that was gnawing. Something was troubled. I was troubled deep inside. And my friends, I have to be honest with you. I've sensed that here. Some of you are got a heavy heaviness in your heart. And that heaviness is saying to you in a quiet voice, something's missing. Something's missing. Yeah, we can sing and we can rejoice and we can shout hallelujah, but something's missing. And we had the best quality of, of the gospel. It was the people that received the prophet at that time. They're the people that received the prophet. Our church and many, many others of the same fellowship of churches. We received the prophet of God. We're the ones that sat and filled up the meeting and drove many miles to listen to William Branham. But when it started coming past the second pole, first pole and second pole, then people begin to fall off. And I knew of other great ministers. I had been in the meetings of Tommy Osborne and Tommy Hicks and Oral Roberts. And then there was uh, Brother Gardner and, and all kinds of great ministries. O.L. Jaggers and on and on. And I sat in meetings and heard these men preach, some of them. 
And it was powerful. And Tommy Osborne had just come back from Argentina and filled up the largest bull stadium in the world, 500,000 people, and showed a film of it in Edmonton. I've been in those kind of meetings, but friends, you can kick me out of here tonight or tomorrow if you wish. Something was missing. Something was missing. And I had a brother-in-law. My brother-in-law's brother was in Cuba during their civil war when Castro was just coming to power. I'm not giving you history. I'm giving you gospel. And he was a man of very few words. I remember it like it happened earlier today and we're carrying a plank between us. And he said, did you hear what William Branham is teaching now? I said, no. I said, because my heart was so heavy, I just was happy to be buried far in the north part of Canada. We didn't care what was happening in the outside world. I was trying to stay as pure and as close to God as I could, but something was missing. You know what was really missing? I had some people baptized. I didn't know exactly how to baptize them. I'd been baptized in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, the titles. My wife had been baptized in the titles. But we didn't know any different. We didn't have any absolute. We didn't have any answers. And I wasn't sure what the Godhead was. One of the brothers that was really a father to me, he thought it was just two. And many others thought it was three. And anyone who thought it was one was called Jesus only. And I didn't know. Now I've been preaching seven years, my friends, seven years. And I didn't know these fundamentals. Was something missing? Yes. You know who knew? He knew. He knew. And I so wanted to talk to Brother Branham. And this was the first time we went out. Well, the caps, I know this will mean something to you. This is our first time. I wanted to talk to him so bad. I want, but I didn't want, I respected his time and respected his rest. And I wanted above all things to give him a rest to his mind. I didn't know all the doctrine or all the things. I didn't know any about, anything about it. And I didn't want to get entangled with politics. Not that he would entangle me in politics, but I just, didn't, I just didn't want to raise any question that would cause him any distress. Just have a peaceful hunt, a rest. Friends, you from Switzerland, you have a beautiful country. We have a similar country. Hello. Magnificent mountains. Soaring into the hills, into the, into the sky. But you know what its beauty is? It's rugged. There's no roads. There's no villages. There's no pasture land. There's no sheep grazing, tame sheep. There's, no, there's nothing there. It's rugged. And it's the way God made it. And the prophet of God loved that country. And went back there every year except his last year, 65. And so we were in the midst of that country. Flowers, God planted them. Grass, trees, water from the glaciers. It was just magnificent. I've looked at flowers and just wept for their beauty. Because God had it. It was God's garden. And it was a rugged, uninhabited place. You could go hundreds of kilometers north, hundreds of kilometers south. You'd never run into a man or a vehicle. There was no sounds, no horns, no sirens, no electric lights. Everything was rugged the way God made it. And I wanted to talk with Brother Branham, but he went with the Brother Southwick. And I went with the trapper from our church, Brother Chris Berg, a very close friend, small man. And this evening after 
we have finished eating. I was going to do dishes. And the reason we went, we didn't have many people. We just wanted to do it ourselves. And Brother Branham said, I think I'll just go maybe get a rabbit or get, because we didn't have any meat. He said, maybe just get some meat. He said, would you like to come, Brother Eddie? Yes, I said, I certainly would like to come. And then Brother Chris Berg, his dear friend, said, yeah, he said, he was Scandinavian. He said, yeah, he said, I think I'll go too. Sure, Brother Branham said, why don't you come? And then he said, no, no, I'm going to stay. I'm going to do the dishes. You go, Brother Eddie. All right. So Brother Branham and I, you know, that was all pre-planned. I didn't know it was pre-planned, but that was all pre-planned. And, and, and Brother Branham and I are walking down this little path. And then he walks off like this. And I just walk with him. And he sits down on a log. He sits on this log. And I'm sitting this way and he's sitting this way. Now friends, I want you to listen real close. I don't tell this to everybody. But this was about the time I was gonna get moved to another place. To another place. I was in a place of heaviness. I was in a place of deep, deep spiritual concern. I just didn't know exactly about certain major things. And I had grave doubts in my heart about Brother Branham because my brother-in-law's brother said, have you heard what Brother Branham is preaching now? And I said, no. He said something about Cain being the son of the serpent. And I said, oh, no. I said, where did you get that? He said, I don't know. And that was in my heart. And we're sitting on this log. And I thought, I read Genesis 4 and 1. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare a son and called his name Cain. So I've gotten a man from the Lord. And I said, that's it. If Brother Brown tries to go around that, listen, friends, I want you to understand me. I said, if Brother Brown tries to go around the word, that'll be the end of our friendship. I, 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 I have to stay with the word of God. So... Brother Branham is sitting there, and he said, uh, we talked about just a couple of things, a few things. And then he said, uh, Brother Eddie said, I was riding on my horse. I believe it was this mountain here. I was uh, going behind Brother Southwick. And he said, uh, he came to me there. I had heard those words when I sat on that platform in some meetings. When Brother Branham would just raise his finger and say, he's here. I knew who it was that was there. I knew that angel of the Lord was there. The angel of the Lord I've heard spoke about in these services. I knew that angel of the Lord was there. And he said, and now I just, I'm telling you my, my story. And he said, he, he came to me there. And when he said that, I don't mean to have my back to you. I just, I looked straight into his face and we're only about that far apart. And his eyes, like yours are not, uh, you know, uh, a person's eyes are, they're kind of crystal, they're clear, they move around and from one place to another. His eyes were just deep set and uh, it was different. And they weren't sharp and intense or nothing like that. But they were like, like a 10,000 candle power. Just a dull, intense. Friends, now what I tell you is absolutely the truth before God. And I looked at him. And he's just looking at me like this. He said he came to me there and I believe you have three questions you want to ask me. Friends, I tell you, 
In that presence, I was naked. In that presence, there was no word for me to speak. In that presence, I didn't wait. I didn't move. I didn't have any happy feeling. I didn't, I didn't have any fearful feeling. But I knew I was in the presence of an awesome person. And that's why I understood. Now, every time I hear the prophet saying, that won't hurt you. That's him, not me. When that prophet would say, I'm in two worlds at this time. Saying, and someone come up and he says to the congregation, you can watch their face now. It, it, it has changed. It's changed because they've come into the presence of the angel of the Lord. And it has a physical, a physical effect upon a person. You can't come into that presence without, it's not just something you feel. It's awesome. No one wants to be exposed. Do you hear me, friends? I would like to be across the desk from you. I'd like to be able to speak your language. I was naked. Uh, there wasn't even any word for me to say. Uh, uh, but uh, there was nothing for me to say. He said, I believe you have three questions. And the first one, and he took them in the order. They were in my heart, in the order of importance. He said, the first one is on the baptism. And the second one is on the Godhead. And the third one is on the serpent's seed. And I, I raised my finger. And I said, Brother Branham, but the scripture says, the scripture says, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, and she said, I've got, uh, I've got a man from the Lord, and his name was Cain. And Brother Branham said, that's exactly the truth. I thought, how can you be saying that? That's my defense. How can you be saying that's exactly the truth? He said, but you need to read the next verse. I, I was a preacher, but I didn't know what the next verse was. And the next verse is, and she again bare his brother Abel. And he said, they were twins. And you know what I said? Oh. That's what I said. Oh. I didn't know they were twins. I'd never heard they were twins. This was something completely new. This was something that came from uh, some place in outer space. They were twins. He said, they've always been twins. Isaac and Ishmael, and Jesus and Judas, and Christ and Antichrist. And by, the time, by the time they come about the same time and they leave about the same time. And I, I'd never heard such things in my life. I thought, oh. They were twins. He says, every revival bears twins. Friends, I want to be the right kind of twin. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to be a born again, blood true son of the living God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and that was the first time. And now I tell you, my dear precious friends, that is where my understanding of him was anchored there. I gained such a holiness. And now you're being so nice. I will, I will relate, if you wish, one that I very seldom tell. Hey, young man, are you listening? We were riding in the car, and he was driving, and I was sitting on the passenger side, and he had that little white cowboy hat on. Kind of put it back. He said, Brother Eddie, what do you think of this ministry? Do you think it could be that of Elijah the prophet as it's foretold in the scripture? And on down and then he went to Revelation and then his voice just trailed off. And I had listened to tapes, some of the old real tapes, and I heard that when he was under uh, a real heavy anointing, 
very heavy in visions. And I, I would hear him say, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh, you come from a certain place, you come from the east, uh-huh, uh-huh. And your daughter wrote you a letter, uh-huh, uh-huh, and that letter's in your purse. His voice would just trail off, and that's, I had observed that. You've seen and heard that. Now I hear his voice just trail off. Do you believe this could be that of Elijah the prophet, as is foretold in the scripture, and then his voice began to trail off, and then the last word I heard was revelation. I felt completely, completely incapable. I felt that I was not to answer this kind of a question. You brothers are listening very intently, and I trust this will mean something to you. And I looked down at the glove box, and I said, well, Brother Branham, for all I know, it must be, because it has every appearance of being. And I kind of looked at him sideways, and he put his head back, a wee bit like this, said, I often kind of wondered, I kind of think so myself. And at that instant, at that instant, just, <laughs> you talk about a wind, you talk about a force, nothing you could feel, there was nothing you could feel, there was nothing physical you could feel, but there was a person, there was a being that sat between he and I. And he was just forward a wee bit, just towards the dash. I could actually tell you exactly how it was. And I thought, I thought, if I breathe in or exhale, I'm going into some other place. I'm going to die. I'm going into another, another world if I breathe. And I didn't want to move. I was frozen. I'm talking to you about him. I'm talking to you about the holiness of this one we call a pillar of fire. And I looked, I just looked, I cast my eyes sideways because I was afraid to move my head. I cast my eyes sideways and looked at him. And Brother Branham's beard, we had about four days of beard. And I know that when a person is under extreme trauma, their beard will stick out prickly. And his beard was prickly, sticking out on his face. And I saw his color had drained from his face. And I thought, he looks like he's near death. Brother Branham rolled his head back slowly, slowly, just over to the side. The eyes were the same as they were when I was on the log. He looked at me and said, Brother Eddie. And I was just thinking, he looks like he's near death. He said, Brother Eddie, I guess he's come to me 10,000 times, 10,000. And that's just every time like I could die. And just at that moment, I had been hunting for moose for meat. A large animal, I stand about two meters at the shoulders. And Brother Branham was driving and he was just, we're going around on the gravel highway, going around this curve, and there's this large animal standing in the middle of the road. And it shocked me. I said, oh, oh, Brother Branham, there's a moose. I said, you know, it, it, just stop, I'll get him. And, he, and his voice is still slow and thick. And he says, it's, it's, all, it's all right, Brother Eddie. It's all right, just get your gun and your shells. I had my gun in my hand. He said, just get your gun and your shells. It's all right. And he just kept driving the same speed. I said, stop, Brother Branham, I'll get him. Now we're just maybe a hundred meters or less. And he said, it's all right. He said something like, it's yours, he's yours. He said, just have your gun. And he drove up the closest I've ever been to a wild animal, about 90 meters and stops, and I get out, and I have a scope on my rifle, and I'm looking through the scope, 
and all I see is hair. I can't even see the animal. And I have to lift the gun up to the sky and see the hump on the animal and bring it down. It's the only time in my life I had that experience. And I pulled the trigger and I saw the bullet actually. Now some of you people may not like this, but this we live on meat. And, uh, and the bullet just entered in and poof. And then I thought, oh, I don't want him to stop. I don't want him to stop on the highway. Someone will come over the hill and hit him and we'll have an accident. I, I thought, and then there's a wide area, maybe like from here to the wall, that's all clear, just grass, and then trees starting there. And I thought, I don't want him to fall there. Some, we don't have room and somebody will come and steal him and take all this meat, maybe five, six, seven hundred pounds of meat, a large animal. And, and I needed that animal for food for my family. And, uh, and, and the moose, he just walked down, stepped off the highway, and he started to walk slowly, slowly. And I know he's not going to go very far. And I don't want him, I need him hid because I don't need him out in this grass. Somebody will steal him. And he walks into the trees, and just as he walks into the trees, I fire another shot. Another young brother was traveling with us, catching a ride. He fired a shot, and the moose stepped over two big logs, two big logs, and was completely hidden and fell right there. You say, would God do that? Absolutely. My father would do that. And completely hid that animal. And we dressed, we dressed the animal, and God's prophet sat on a tree right beside us. And he watched me and the other young man, and we dressed this animal, got it all ready, got it dressed. We finished, wiped our knives, walked back to the car. Brother Brown walked with me. We got in the car. He sat in his seat, and I sat. Friends, I'm not given over to special things, but I was surrounded in an atmosphere. It was, it was so divine. It even had a color. It was like emerald green. There was nothing my eyes were registering. I thought, this is the most beautiful place. I thought, oh God, I'd like to just live here forever. And the prophet laid his head back. Looked at me, he said, Brother Eddie, Every time he comes, something good happens. Amen. Brother Cullen, brother, you called this meeting, and you precious people came. I don't know where you come from, but this is the one I come to tell you about. And every time he comes, something good happens. I'm talking to you young ladies. Every time he comes, he knows exactly the deep, deep, deep. Something that's so deep you can't speak about it. Something that's so deep nobody knows about it. Maybe a wife, something so deep the husband doesn't know. Or the wife doesn't know. It's so deep. But I want to tell you I'm a living witness. There's one that knows. It's one that's got that in his hand. And that was the prophet's ministry, is to put us in contact with him. And I'm telling you today, I was in contact. Every time he comes, something good happens. And I'm praying that something good happens for you. God bless you, my precious brother. God bless you, my dear friends. God bless you. That's, that's all I can say today. Every time he comes, young ladies, every time he comes, does he know about a young lady? Yes, he does. He knows exactly what your heart says. We've got a young lady here from our church that traveled all the way. Sister Melissa Snow. He knows exactly Sister Melissa what's in your heart. He knows what's in your young man's heart. I got a text. 
today from a young man in our church. His daddy is in, in Sierra Leone, I believe, right now. He's away from his daddy. There's seven or eight children. He's the eldest son. He said, I'm just writing you, Pastor. Please pray for me. You boys, you young men, if you'd remember to pray for Richard, I'd ask you to pray for Richard. He said, I need, I need God. Isn't it wonderful to be in contact, to have somebody that is in, has confidence in you? You know what? I don't believe in a fictitious God. I believe in a God that's a reality. I believe in a God that speaks. I believe in a God that will send a prophet to your door. Send a message to your door. He knows just what we have need of. Thank you, brothers, for coming. Let's just stand to our feet, would we? You know that song, brother? My Jesus knows just what I need. My, my Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. My Jesus knows just what I need. Oh, yes, he knows just what I need. He satisfies and every need supplies. Yes, he knows just what I need. He knows what you need. He met me on a log. Maybe he'll meet you in this place. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Heavenly Father, I did not expect to say these things. I did not expect to come before these people. I expected to speak, have the message on my heart, but you had something more important. And I say, Lord Jesus, thy will be done. Oh God, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy perfect will be done. And now I'm thinking of the precious people how dear they are to you. How dear they are to you, O oh God. You're touching their hearts. You're touching their lives. You're speaking to them. I know that you are. You're speaking to them, and I pray that they will answer. I want to ask you, dear friends, just say to him, Jesus, you know, you know what Brother Biscoll was craving for. You know what I'm craving for. You know, I, I pray for the reality of this message. I pray for the reality of this message to come and live in me. And while I'm saying that, if you're in your seat and you'd like to come here and dedicate yourself and say, I'm one of those and I'm praying for that reality to be in my life. I just pray that he will, he will come and meet me. I have a craving in my heart for the Lord Jesus. If you'd like to come and stand here, we'll pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, you're the one that talks to the hearts. You talk to my heart. You know who it is that you might be speaking to. This is the way we want to end the service. We just pray. I pray that the God, the God of Elijah, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you'll come, oh God, You'll bless every person with your presence. 
May the divine one, the divine presence, come and surround these, my precious friends. My brothers, those that I shall live in eternity with. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. God, God of William Bradham, God who used him. You came to me. I can truly say you came to me. When I could not come to you, I could not come to where you were. You came to me. You found me in the mountains and here we are at a camp. Oh God, we have done all of our, we've done our best. Brother Colin Brenner has done his best. He desired with all his heart, oh God, that there be a place, a place where the people will be able to just offload themselves and invite you, Lord Jesus. I say, come, O Holy One of Israel, come. O Holy Spirit of God, come. And I pray, Father, I dedicate this group of people. I dedicate them to you, to your cause. I dedicate them to the cause of Christ, who said after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses unto me. Lord Jesus, send these people from this place and from this campground. Send them, O oh God, with a nature, the same hunger, the same appetite that you had when you said it's uh, my meat. You know nothing of my meat. My meat is to do the will of the Father. You were speaking to the woman at the well. Oh, God, we're here waiting upon you. I'm praying, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God bless you, sisters. God bless you. May the God, may the God of Elijah bless you, my precious brother. Oh, may you be able to witness after you've left here. He came to me. He came to me when I could not come to where he was. He came to me. Yes, my brother. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Surely, surely, surely. Oh, God, you came to express your love. Please. This my brother, oh God, this my brother, oh my God, my God. Don't be afraid to say what's in your heart. You can say it to him. You can say it to him. You can speak to him. Oh God, oh God, oh God. Yes, my father, my father, my father. My Father, my Father, let this be a meeting, O oh God, where a soul meets with us. Oh, you'll be the answer. You'll be the full solution to his life. Oh, God, oh God. Blessed Lord, blessed Lord, blessed Lord. Remove every obstacle, O oh God. Put his life in harmony with you, I pray. Oh, my Lord Jesus, my Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Why don't you that are there in your seats, why don't you just lay your hand upon someone beside you? They have a hunger. Oh, God, why don't you pray for them? The prophet often did this. Yes, one member of the bride of Jesus Christ laying hand on another, a concerned hand, a loving hand, a voice that knows this word, a voice that knows this message. Yes, oh, God. Yes, Father, you will do it. We lay hands upon one another. Oh God, you bless these, these. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I've noticed my brother. 
the sincerity of soul. Mighty God, let this be a visitation. Let this be a spot where he's kneeling, a holy place where a man meets his maker, his creator. Oh, God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. My Jesus knows. Oh, my Jesus knows. My Jesus knows. Hallelujah. God bless you, translators. God bless you, deacons. God bless you, hungry souls. May you be filled and satisfied by our Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, oh God. Yes, oh God. I said, talk to him. Talk to him. Every time he comes, something good happens. Every time he comes, something good happens. Something good is happening. Something good is happening. But men and women make love and come to him. Oh, God, oh, God. My Lord Jesus. My Lord Jesus. Do we have a song we could sing?
Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his holy That's the reason why I love him so. Lord Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And I love Sing it one more time. Oh, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And oh, he's just the same as his So I'll sing it to him now. And I love him. Oh, yes, I love him. He's the only one true lover. come behind something like that. It's him. It's real. Oh, it's so real. He's real today, friends. Oh, my father, my father. I have nothing more, nothing to say. 
the Lord said it all. He spoke to your hearts. The, uh, <clears throat> I know the announcements are supposed to be made. I believe the supper is all ready uh, to be served, so we can go straight there afterwards. And uh, for the uh, evening service, uh, it will begin at 7.30. The doors will be open by 7.00. It's about uh, seven minutes before six o'clock now. So uh, if, it, if it starts a little late, I suppose that'll be all right. But we'll aim to start the service at 7.30. So you can go from here right to the dining halls. And uh, supper, I'm sure, is ready and waiting. Every time he comes, something wonderful happens. Isn't he wonderful? Brother Sigmar, isn't this your heart's desire, what's going on right now? I know it's been his, for many years, he's wanted to see the bride as one, united under the headship of Jesus Christ and him alone. And the spirit of Christ is in the building right now. So just, you're not out of order, just take him with you to dinner. Let him sit beside you and bring him back for the evening service, all right? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Amen. You, you may be seated. The brothers can come dismiss you now. And I love him. Yes, I love him. He's the only one true lover of my soul. So glad for that. And I love